So this lecture is a short lecture about understanding geomorphic response to uplift, and we apply it to this pressure, which is called the dragon's back. And you'll see, I'll explain why it's called the dragon's back in a few moments. Um, so the outline is uh, a little bit of reminder of geomorph and tectonic displacements. The idea of advecting topography, so advecting means moving and substitution of space for time. And then the dragon's back pressure ridge as a place to explore these relationships. So here it is. Here's this crazy thing. So the San Andreas Fault is behind it. And it's this huge ridge. And we call it the dragon's back because it looks like the back of a dragon coming out of the valley. So, you know, this is the, the back. And these are the ribs. I don't know if you guys agree, but that's the idea. Dragon's back. And so it's three kilometers long from here to here. And one thing you can see right away is it's, uh, it's got, it, you know, it's this, this end is steeper and taller and sharper than this end. And so what the idea we're going to do is say that there might be a, it's, we say substitution of space for time. So what that means is I'm going to make the argument that as we go from here along the, pressure ridge to here, we're actually seeing, we're moving in space, we're actually going back in time. And so this is the idea of this site. So the definition of uh, tectonic geomorphology, one definition is how do surficial processes respond to deformation and what are the possible feedbacks between them? How can we use the signal of deformation in the landscape and over the lake returnary? So usually this applies just to the last 100,000 years or so uh, to bridge the gap between these annual time scales like geodesy time scales and million year time scales, which would be geology. So here's another view of the dragon's back. And so this I worked on for my PhD and then uh, a student, George Hilly, he worked with me for his PhD and he worked on it also. So both of us have done a lot on this and he really pushed the analysis and made it uh, really rich. So just to remind you this this uh, diagram, so we see some topography now had some original shape and then plus what happens tectonically plus what happens geomorphically. So in the case of the dragon's back, there's, there's a strong geomorphic signal of erosion, but there's also a strong tectonic signal of uplift. And so this, ha the topography is a real combination of the two. Whereas when we look at the stream channels that are offset, they're really mostly tectonic displacement. We don't care about the erosion of the stream channel very much. So here's the idea of this, this uh, pressure ridge is that this would be uplift. This is a map and this is distance in meters. And so, and this would be the San Andreas fault on the back here. And so what we think is there's some stationary uplift zone. A material comes into that uplift zone and it lifts up and then it's carried away. And so this is the, this is the rate and then this is the total rock uplift. So it comes in, it's lifting up and it stays high and it gets offset like that. Okay. So let me see. Do I have a movie? No. Uh, I have it in here. That's, uh, I think this one. So you can, this one actually has the, the uplift location moving, but it's a reference time. You can move material through the fixed uplift, or you can move the uplift through the material. It, it gives the same pattern. So here's the idea. The, the, the material is moving through this fixed uplift zone, and so we have uplift, instantaneous uplift rate and total uplift. So this is the idea of advection. The material is uplifted, it kind of moves through the uplift zone. So that's the model for how it works. And I'll, I'll show, let me move this over so you can see what that is. So here's the geology for and the topography. So here's the topography and you can see the movie just how this end is very steep and, and tall. And as we come this direction, the drainages get, they're more gentle. 
until you get to here. And then, and so, as I said, we're going to substitute space for time and say that this end is in the area of this active uplift. But remember, it's a strike to the fault. The material moves, it's uplifted and carries away from that uplift zone. But the drainages, they initiate and then they erode down. So these are older than these in this model, if you accept this, okay? And here's the geology. So it, it has basically a, a, a mostly it's, it's one, it's two units, but they're basically the same resistance to erosion, just two different sands and gravel packages. And, and as you go this direction, you can see we erode down into the lower unit. And there's a small secondary fault in the front. So here's the geologic cross sections through this thing. So here would be in the area of the active uplift zone. And then this would be uh, past there. There's a little fault here in the front, but most of the uplift is, is here in the, in, the, in the main block. And you see the San Andreas relationship here and a little landslide sliding off the back. And then when we come down here to the older end, you see it's just eroded down into all of the underlying material. So you may say, well, what, why, what causes the stationary uplift zone? And we think it's a model like this one where the material's moving in and the fault below isn't planar. It has a, like a knuckle on it, we say. So this knuckle's down there and the material moves in and it, it hits the knuckle and has to ride over the knuckle. And so that means that the knuckle is fixed to the far side of the fault, and, and that gives us this relatively stationary uplift fault and carried away. So you may or may not agree with the structural model, but this is uh, what we've, we've, a lot of geologic mapping and some geophysical studies of the site seem to show that the, are consistent with an offset in the fault surface. So with all that, we can start to look at the geomorphic response to this uplift and using this idea of substitution of space for time. So here's the instantaneous rock uplift rate. And, and the way we can calculate this is we reconstruct the uplift using the geology. So we assume that on, down here, when it's away from the uplift zone, the layers are basically flat. And as they come in, they're, they're tilted. And this tilting and displacement gives us the, the rock uplift rate right here. So that's rate. And then this would just be the total rock uplift. So it looks like the rate and the rate we know, the horizontal motion is the, from Wallace Creek. It's 35 millimeters a year. So we assume the material is moving through this uplift zone 35 millimeters a year. So uh, this whole pressure ridge is, maybe a hundred thousand years of time with this model okay and so therefore we can take distance along the pressure ridge and turn into time so that's how we get the rate here's the total so it looks like there's a total of about 80 meters of uplift so it's not a huge amount and one thing we can see then is that the relief is really greatest just past the high uplift rate so this is an important result because Usually when you do topographic metrics and you say high relief, and remember this morning I said high relief is con consistent with high uplift rates, we would say, well, the high relief should be right here in the high uplift rate, but it's actually offset from it. And what we think is it takes time for the drainages to, in, to respond. So they're uplifting, but they, it takes them a little while to cut down and, and to build that relief. So because the relief comes from the height difference from the valley bottom to the ridge top. So in this area, the, the height difference between the valley bottom, bottoms and ridge tops is low. And then as we come in here, they get really deep. But as we come to this end, the, the ridge lines start to lower. So here's a, just somewhat, it looks like in the field. So here's one drainage there. And we'll look upstream, it's really steep. And and um, and so then if we go to the middle, this one's actually uh, right here. No, 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 sorry. Uh, this is looking, this is A looking 
upstream, and then we go to the top, and we look downstream. So that's this one, just looking down. And so it's pretty steep. Now here in the middle, B, there's looking up. And so you see now the channel's more concave. It's really like this now, whereas before it was maybe more straight. And there it's looking down. So really steep upper portion and then pretty flat bottom. And then on the far end, C, this one is overall just lower, lower relief. It's, it's not as steep, but it has well-developed side channels. Here's a view from the top. So what I just showed you in this model is landscape evolution. So that's 100,000 years to go from where it started to there with this model. So it's uh, why we think it's really special is this opportunity to explore how the landscape can change. So here then are the profiles of these channels. So just remember A is kind of in the active uplift zone. B is just after it was uplifted and it's kind of really responding to the uplift. And C is past, it's kind of old. So what this will show is the along channel profile, the side tributaries, and the cross valley profile. So these are field surveys from when I was doing my PhD. So here's the, the A, the first one I showed you. So high uplift rate zone. So you see pretty straight channel and V-shaped profiles. So there's the B, so now it's it's past the uplift zone, it's starting to erode down, and you see it's bigger, the top is more V-shaped, the bottom's more U-shaped. There's C, so this is the old one, and it's just, just pretty low, right? And here they are all together. So this shows, and then with our idea of the distance along the pressure ridge of time, this gives a sense of how long it would take for these changes to occur. So kind of 30, 000, 30 to 40,000 years between each. And you see overall the, the kind of, as it gets older, the, the sides become more low angle. So this just is a map then along the pressure ridge of the different landforms. So this is just uh, ridges and developing tributaries. So just sort of a process and geomorphic map, what's, what's where. And so what George was trying to show here is that these, uh, there's kind of more developing young channels, whereas in this area, they're more established and even some are kind of dying back. There's just not enough relief to keep the drainages going. So, uh, we can come back to this, and this is going to be our main activity this afternoon, as soon as I get done talking, is I'll show you how to make these kinds of, of 3D views of the landscape, and we'll divide up the dragon's back. So some people will take one end, some in the middle, and some on the far end, and then we can all compare our results. But just to remind you the idea of, you know, contributing area, which is increasing going down, and local slope. And so here's, remember, the concavity and stream gradient index. So just as a final figure, uh, what George was able to show is comparing rock uplift rate, cumulative rock uplift, the local relief. So as I said, the local relief is highest past the uplift zone because it takes some time to respond. The concavity is, is similar, although we do see those big drainages in the middle that are, you know, quite concave. But Overall, it's pretty even concavity, but again, remember what I said is that the channel steepness, the KSN, goes with the rock uplift rate. So in the rock uplift zone uh, where it's uplifting, the channel steepness is higher than outside. So it seems to, again, show that this KSN, this morphometric approach, can, is consistent with zone kind of mapping high and low uplift. So, questions? Yeah, so just first make look at the observations. So these, this one here is A, and here's what we see in the field. So look up there, so you see it's quite steep. And so when I say the, the profile, the river channel profile, I mean this line right here, okay? 
And then when I say the tributary profiles, I mean this line right there and this line. And then when I say cross valley profiles, I mean this one and this one. So they're kind of the ridge profiles. Okay. So then I come down. So this is the same one looking down. I go to the middle B looking up. So here what you'll see is you see that central profile is flat on the bottom and then it gets very steep at the end. And then you see the cross valley profiles are kind of smooth down here, whereas up here they're more of a V. And then this is the same one looking down. Go to the old ones, old in quotes. You see overall it's just lower, it's not as steep, but the tributaries are more well developed. You see you have to kind of go around like this to go upstream. But the cross valley profile is very open. But now if we go and we look at the, these guys, I'll just show all of them together. So that, that's what we see. So elevation versus distance. So these are profiles, topographic profiles that I surveyed. So this is just down the center of the drainage. Okay, then let's, uh, there's more I can say. And, and uh, the Dragon's Back, I'm like crazy about the Dragon's Back. I talk about it all the time. But uh, maybe you want to do some work instead of listening to me. So here's what, what I propose is, is uh, for some learning, but also the group activity. So if you look inside your, your Dragon's Back folder, I have these. I, I gave you the digital surface model for one meter DEM. And there's also a one meter hill shade. And... Uh, I have the 10.1, 10.0, and 9.3. And uh, mm, so we need to fix it. Let me just explain that exercise, and then we can do it together. So here it is. So what, what I want to suggest is that we do the following is, is everyone will open this in arc, and then what we'll do is we'll divide up the room, and we'll go around. And so, you know, you guys over here, you can choose a drainage in, in the uplift zone. And then in the middle, this group can do the middle of the pressure ridge, and then you guys can do a drainage on the north, uh, west, and the old one. And so what, what I want to do is to... The first thing will be to clip out a single drainage. So we'll, we'll trace with the shape file. Just click, 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 come down. Identify one drainage with this polygon, a single polygon, and cut it. And then once we have that, then we'll go through the sequence of, pro of events that um, is basically in my, my little... Uh, video here about hydrologic processing. So we'll do uh, fill pits, compute the flow directions, and compute flow accumulation, and then we'll visualize it. Okay? So why don't everybody, if you, you want to do it, just make sure your RCS is working, and uh, let's go together, okay? So if, if, you, if your GIS doesn't work, then go to somewhere else.